This is Richard Wolf from Democracy at Work responding to another Ask Prof. Wolf question from our Patreon community. This one comes from William Cowley, and it asks me to talk about the contribution of the great Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci. And I welcome the question. It is a pleasure to return, as I often have in my lifetime, to this absolutely remarkable and brilliant thinker, unquestionably the greatest contributor so far uh, of the many that Italy has contributed to the growing Marxian tradition of thought. Antonio Gramsci, famous as a uh, child of Sardinia, that island off the mainland of Italy, uh, from the poorest of the poor backgrounds. He grew to become an enormously important uh, figure in Italian history and politics. He founded and led the Italian Communist Party in its early years. He was famous for having organized one of the greatest strikes at the beginning of the 20th century in Torino, in the north of Italy, against the then very powerful Fiat automobile uh, factory family. And he went on to be a political leader, arrested illegally by the Mussolini government, the fascist government of Italy, imprisoned for the last dozen or so years of his life, badly treated, not given the medical attention. For the rest of us, those years in jail produced his most important work called The Prison Notebooks of Antonio Gramsci. There is a complete translation into English of these works published by the Columbia University Press in New York. He was allowed to leave prison a couple of months before he died. Uh, from the conditions imposed on him by the fascist government of Italy at the time. What is he famous for? Well, there are many ways to get at it. I want to talk about the theoretical contribution he made, because if I've read uh, William Cowley's question correctly, that's what he's interested in. But I do want to say a word about the fact that this fellow from Sardinia, proved to be a genius political organizer. The strike against fiat back at the beginning of the century was a masterful job of organizing workers in a way that had never been seen in Italy before. He organized not only a powerful communist party in Italy, but let me be clear to everyone here. Italy had the most important, largest, most popular communist party of any country in Europe. It was the most powerful communist party in Western Europe after World War II for many, many years. It was a basic part of the life of Italy, city by city, factory by factory, village by village. And the organization of that political party, especially in the unwelcome cir circumstances of Italian capitalism, was an enormous achievement for which Antonio Gramsci deserves credit. But his most remarkable theoretical contribution can be summarized as follows. When he looked at what had happened in the Soviet Union, when the revolution of 1917, and so on. When he looked at the revolutionary possibilities in Italy, all around him, and that's where he spent his life, and that's what he devoted his intellectual and physical strength to, he reached a conclusion, which he put roughly this way. The conditions for a revolution, in terms of the poverty, in terms of the exploitation of the mass of the Italian people, north and south, farmers, industrial workers, urban and rural, all of it. The conditions were there for 
Italy to have a socialist revolution. What he called the objective conditions were there. But they weren't ripe yet subjectively. In other words, everything was in place to have, to make, and to succeed with a revolution. And he admired much about the Soviet revolution in 1917, so we can imagine that he would have tried to adapt that to the different circumstances in Italy. But what was not ready for the revolution was subjective, was the mental pictures in the minds of the Italian people, their feelings, their thoughts, their commitments to their Roman Catholic religion, their commitments to their regions, to the institutions of importance to them, the village, the family, and so on. So what Antonio Gramsci did in all those years imprisoned was to keep notebooks and give himself the task of adding to all the analysis that had come out of the Marxian tradition, analysis of economics, of politics, of what we would nowadays call sociology, how the society is put together. The focus of all of that in the Marxian tradition were the objective conditions. How is unemployment? How is inflation? How is the factory working? But what Antonio Gramsci wanted to add was the need also to understand how was this being processed in the minds of the people? What is the mentality? Will the mentality see the need for the possibility for a successful revolution? Because in order to have a successful revolution, you need not only the objective conditions that make it possible, but you need the subjective conditions in people's minds that they want to do that, that they want to get together with one another, that they see through the self-celebration of capitalism to the need for and the possibility of a revolutionary break to something better. And for that reason, he studied literature and poetry and music and the Roman Catholic Church and the liturgy and everything that shapes how people see the world so that he could add a subjective Marxist analysis about the possibilities of revolution to the traditional objective analysis of what's possible. And that led to vast new openings of research that many, many Marxists ever since then uh, have been developing further so that the tradition now is much more balanced between objective and subjective, between what's happening in the society, but what's also going on culturally inside the ways we think about the world. It's a much more balanced analytical and revolutionary tradition now, thanks to Gramsci, than it was before. This is Richard Wolff for Democracy at Work.